This podcast is not legal advice and should not be relied upon as such. You should always obtain legal advice about your specific circumstances. Welcome to the second episode of Tax Records, our podcast looking at the latest hot topics in tax. My name is Adam Demack, and I'm a senior associate in the Hall and Wilcox tax team. Today, I'm joined by one of our tax partners, Anthony Bradica, and we're going to talk about the tax issues and risks when you engage a contractor. Now, as we're all probably aware, we've had two recent high court decisions relating to the employee contractor distinction. Separate to that, I think it's clear that when you operate a business and engage a contractor, you need to be aware of a number of tax risks associated with the arrangement. Anthony, I think it's fair to say uh, that generally business owners who engage contractors often think that the costs of doing so are far less than if they engage that worker as an employee. Um, What are your views on this? Hi, Adam. Uh, For a long time now, employers and workers have assumed that by structuring their working arrangement as a contracting relationship, that there are no or minimal tax obligations associated with the relationship. Now, if you mischaracterise the relationship, this can have significant financial cost, uh, particularly for the person who engages the contractor. And so what are the critical tax risks that we need to know about if a principal or a business owner does engage someone as a contractor? Look, I think there's uh, there's a few things to talk about, um, but there are four aspects of tax uh, that I really just wanted to touch on today. The first is that it's not always easy to differentiate between a contractor and an employee. Just because the parties believe their relationship is one of contracting doesn't mean that the law sees it the same way. Secondly, I think the distinction is often driven by the agreement between the parties. So having a contract in place is critical. The third risk I'll touch on is the common misconception that you don't have to pay superannuation to a contractor. And the final risk I often see is to ignore payroll tax. Okay, so going back to that first risk, uh, how can you tell uh, when a worker or whether a worker is an employee or a contractor? The legal test is is a subtle one. Um, Employment is often considered to involve a contract of service. And this goes back to the old master servant days where we say that the employee provides service to the employer, they work for the employer. In contrast, a contracting arrangement is one where a worker has a contract for services, where the worker is working in their own business, if you like, but providing services to a number of principals. Could you give us an example maybe of that? Yeah, sure. So let's just say that I run a business installing air conditioners and I need to use a plumber for those installations. In that case, I might engage a plumber as a contractor Now that plumber might work for other installers as well. Uh, The plumber's effectively running their own business and they're providing a service to my business and all the other principals who engage them. The plumber's going to determine which jobs they do, uh, when they'll uh, work for those jobs, when they'll do them, and they'll have the flexibility in how they perform those services. They're gonna be a typical contractor. Now let's say that because I do a lot of installations and need a reliable plumber that I can call on at any time for an installation, I might employ a plumber as part of my team. As an employer, I can direct that plumber which jobs to go to, I might ask them to wear a company uniform and so on. I've got more control over the performance of that plumber than if they're a contractor. But I'm also gonna have employment and tax obligations, such as having to pay leave entitlements, deduct tax from their income, pay super and payroll tax on their wages. But now let's say that I change the facts slightly and. And Adam, let's just say that you're a plumber. I say to you, Adam, rather than you running around giving other people quotes and chasing work, I've got a lot of installation work for you. I can give you plenty of work and I start giving you lots of work that keeps you busy for 40 hours every week. After a while, uh, you stop advertising your plumbing business and you start working exclusively on jobs that are sourced through my installation business. Now, even though we start off assuming that you're a contractor, are you still a contractor if I'm your only customer, if you just rely on me to give you all of your plumbing jobs and I start directing you to go to the jobs I want you to go to, this is the real grey area where it's difficult to tell if a worker is a contractor or an employee. Yep, I can understand that. And um, it seems like this Adam is a better plumber maybe than I am a lawyer. Um, 
given that that it is a gray area what what steps can people take to help to work out the label to put on someone uh-huh. well look, the, uh, the the contract between the worker and the business is critical um, now there may be a written agreement or in a lot of cases the parties may have had some sort of handshake deal for a, um, a going, going rate, say $120 an hour, and go from there. And for a long time, the courts would say that when you had to consider whether a worker was an employee or a contractor, you'd look to the day-to-day working arrangements of the parties. This was the way to assess whether the worker was an employee or not. You know, how often did they work? How many days? How many hours in the day? Did they have to wear a uniform? Did they work for other principals? If they botched a job, Whose responsibility was it to rectify the defect and so on? So that that sounds like a very sort of fact-heavy analysis. Is this still the test that we apply given the recent uh, cases that we've had? Yeah, that's a great point. Now, it appears that we've moved away from that test, and that's only a recent move away. Um, In February of this year, uh, the High Court, in in a number of cases, uh, said that to work out if someone's an employee or not, it's no longer necessary to look at the day-to-day behaviours of the parties. You just need to look at the contract that they've made between them. Now, that means that if the parties enter into what they call a contracting agreement and the agreement sets out the key terms of their working relationship and those terms are more aligned with contracting, then the worker is going to be a contractor regardless of how the parties interact on a day-to-day basis. And, I mean, in the tax world, we often talk about taxable facts uh, and we probably all come across circumstances where there just is no contract what what do we do then look Adam it's not an uncommon situation for there to be no contract but the problem here is that without a contract the courts are just going to look um, at the way the relationship operates and that will make the arrangement even more difficult to characterize and will likely cause more tax risk it's going to mean that if you don't have a contracting agreement with your worker you need to put one in place because it will help to evidence that you've engaged a contractor and not an employee if that's what you want to achieve. Understand. So it probably makes sense to go back and do that housekeeping and get a, a written contract put in place. Um, back to the tax risks, though, I think the next one you mentioned uh, related to superannuation and contractors. Is that right? Uh, yeah. So, so as we all know, you've got to pay superannuation to your employees And currently the super guarantee rate is at uh, 10% for the 2022 year. And as we all know, know, contractors are not employees, but superannuation also can apply to people who are deemed to be employees. And can contractors be uh, deemed to be employees for superannuation purposes? They can be, yes. Uh, In the case of contractors, you need to pay super if the contract with the worker is uh, wholly or principally for their labour. Now, in that example I gave earlier about Adam the plumber, um, even if um, Adam in that example that I gave is a genuine contractor, um, because he's providing plumbing services to my business, and that's labour, he's providing labour to my business, I've got to pay him super, even though he's a contractor. All right. And what about business owners who haven't done that in the past? Is it a case that, you know, the past is the past, you know, everyone did it, I was a bit unsure maybe about my situation? Or are there some additional risks? And, and is there a cutoff? Or is, is, this, is this something that you know, can, can hang over the head of a business owner or a principal forever? Yeah, I think unfortunately so, Adam. Um, this aspect of contracting isn't well understood. And, and people seem to think that uh, what happens in the past is in the past and, and should stay there. But unfortunately, that's not the way the, uh, the regulator, the tax regulator, the ATO works. Um, and what I've seen is that after a few years, you know, when the working relationship goes bad and people become aware of their rights, um, this is where a contractor who's been underpaid their super, uh, they may go and contact the ATO and complain that they've missed out on being paid super over many years. And this claim for super, for unpaid super, isn't just limited to blue collar workers either. You know, we're seeing more and more professionals, you know, white collar workers who set themselves up as contractors looking to get um, back pay of super. And look, whilst 10% superannuation guarantee may not seem like a lot of unpaid super, you know, if you're running a business with three to four contractors and you fail to pay super for four, five, maybe 10 years, and look, there's no time limit for superannuation to claim back the back pay of super, you know, the costs can really mount up. Yeah, I imagine that they'd mount up pretty quickly. What should a business owner do if they find themselves in this situation? 
Look, unfortunately, the, the answer here is um, it depends. Um, it may be the terms of the arrangement may make it unclear whether super is actually payable. So it becomes a, you know, an argument about whether or not um, super is payable or not. It can also depend on whether the ATO has already come knocking on your door. Um, and depending on the circumstances, look, if there is unpaid super, it's usually going to make good sense to make some sort of a disclosure to the ATO. At least what that might do is save you some significant penalties. Um, now, this is an area where we've had some success in recent years, often avoiding the penalties for businesses that have unwittingly failed to pay superannuation to their contractors. Yeah, it's, it sounds like in those situations, a disclosure uh, would make a lot of sense. Um, moving on from superannuation, what about payroll tax? Is it the same for contractors in terms of payroll tax? Yes, it's, it's somewhat similar. Uh, payroll tax is payable on payments made to contractors for the performance of work. And this is going to be the case for most contracting arrangements. Okay. Is payroll tax payable on all payments to contractors, though? Well, Adam, there are payroll tax thresholds in each state and territory. In Victoria, the threshold is $700,000 for the 2022 year. Um, in New South Wales, it's $1.2 million. And so you've got to count your payments to contractors as part of those thresholds. But if your annual wages and contracting payments bill is below these thresholds, there's no payroll tax to pay. If you're above those thresholds, there are some exemptions from payroll tax that might apply. In my example that I gave earlier, if Adam provides his services to, to other clients, or if I engage Adam for less than 90 days in a year, then the payments I make to him may be exempt from payroll tax. Look, the exemptions are quite prescriptive, but they can provide a get out of jail card and help you to escape having to pay payroll tax. The risks are um, ever present, and this is just simply a snapshot of some of those tax issues that you've got to consider when you engage a contractor. Thanks, Anthony. Um, I think you've offered some great insights about the tax risks associated with engaging a contractor and probably um, gone some way towards uh, narrowing the uh, alleged or uh, purported gap between uh, engaging someone as a contractor or employee. Um, thanks, everyone, for tuning into today's episode. As you've heard, uh, there can be critical tax risks when engaging a contractor, so it's important to get it right and to understand those risks. If you have any questions about what we've covered today, please contact a member of our tax team. You can find our details on our website, paulandwilcox.com.au, or you can connect with one of us on LinkedIn. And if you've enjoyed today's episode, please rate, review and follow our podcast wherever you're listening to podcasts. You can subscribe on our website to be notified about upcoming episodes. 